I want to welcome to the show Fox and Rob Richardson. Welcome. Hi, hey, thank hey, you. How are you. I am so excited about today's conversation. You guys have a book out called Time, and it's all about y'all's story. And it's not just any book, it was a documentary that was an Oscar nominated. Hello. And yeah. really, <laughs> yeah, that's such a big accomplishment. Let's just start out by hearing about you guys and your story, and we'll go from there. Well, uh, for those of you that are uh, familiarizing yourselves uh, for the first time uh, with us, we are uh, Fox and Rob Rich, a formerly incarcerated couple. Uh, we spent more than 21 years behind bars before receiving clemency in uh, 2018. Uh, we left that experience uh, believing that to be free is to free others, and we started an organization, uh, PDM NOLA, which is Participatory Defense Movement NOLA, uh, about six months after um, after my release from prison, uh, where we teach legal awareness as a best form of defense to uh, justice-involved people uh, in our efforts to, uh, to reduce harm. Um, and... Um, I think that we could probably cut back to uh, 1987 uh, when we met for the very first time. Uh, I fell in love uh, with Fox uh, the very first moment uh, that I met her. And I probably spent uh, the following months thereafter convincing her that she was equally <laughs> as much in love with me. Um, but um, fast forward after about 10 years of on again, off again relationships with one another, uh, we took each other's hand in marriage. Uh, we eloped, uh, went to Kissimmee, St. Cloud, Florida, where we got married in a small wedding chapel there. Uh, we bungee jumped uh, in an yeah, effort yeah. to consummate our marriage. Uh, we came back home uh, as high school sweethearts, now married, uh, with hopes and dreams of uh, uh, of starting a, uh, a robust uh, future together. Mm -hmm. uh, we bought a home. We started a business. And six months later, uh, we found ourselves uh, in the criminal justice system. Mm -hmm. And the uh, book, uh, Time, as well as the documentary, uh, Time, both... Um, takes us through that journey, you know, of what, um, you know, the, um, the experience was for uh, both Fox as a uh, single parent mother uh, of six children, uh, trying to navigate that process uh, on the other side of prison walls after her uh, release, and uh, me basically navigating and doing much of the same uh, from inside of uh, prison walls. And, um, that is um probably the my my rendition of uh, <laughs> how the, the, a short end of a very long of a very long story. What I'm hearing you guys yes. say is that you guys were kind of quote normal people. Mm -hmm. You you got married, you had kids, you got a house, and in your book it, you said a three bedroom, two bath house, just like a normal yes. starter, starter home. home. You know, right. you, you started your business, like everything seemed so normal. And I don't want to say easy because I'm sure there were challenges in that, but it felt very just kind of like what we think about the American life being. Yeah. Right. And That's so right. how did it, how did you go from that to uh, robbing a bank and then going mm -hmm. to jail in only six months time? Mm -hmm. What what's what, what was in between there? Um, I think uh, much in the way that uh, that movies unfold, they give you all of this bright, pretty stuff in probably the first uh, two to three minutes of the uh, subjects of the uh, film. And then probably about the third or fourth minute of the film, everything just falls apart. Uh, for us, uh, we defied the uh, rules of um, of business and that being uh, location, location, location. Uh, and we um, opened up a um, what would be a uh, hip hop clothing store uh, in an area of town that was um, that was district him. as they uh, as an industrial um, gotcha. uh, part of town. Uh, so we didn't have the walk by traffic that um, shops like ours uh, generally uh, benefit mm -hmm. from um, the house that we bought. That was the uh, the beautiful the starter home, home for us. Uh, we found out that the uh, foundation was cracked and it shifted and, and the, the roof, roof leaked. Oh, uh, no. Beautiful carpet and everything else that we put in the place when we first moved in got soaked uh, every time that it rained. Um, and... 
had that with our son who yes. after we married um started having seizures and oh, um, wow. rushed him to the hospital with an and, and they had you know um couldn't diagnose what was going on with him right and so it was just like um as soon as everything was so perfect it rained right you know it was like life and god wanting to test you like uh yeah you think you got it all together but let me show you mm -hmm. something and so and we thought that we'd be able to build our way out of it because we had a good uh we had a good what we believed to be a good solid business plan at that time and we got back only to find out that um that our investor backed out on us uh so we were left holding the bag because we had um um anticipating that we had a, a financial backer for our business project uh we spent existing capital that we had prior to uh, you know setting up and putting the infrastructure and those things in place so by the time we made it back, uh, we had basically um, spent all of uh, mm. the money that we had saved. Uh, and in an act of desperation, uh, we robbed a bank in our efforts to uh, regain financial solvency for our family's mm. business. Um, and I think, um, Melissa, for me, I know so often people think, you know, oh, my God, but, you know, you do the crime, you do the time. We hear that so so often so, that is so cliche and I have really kind of learned not to just kind of let that flow off of me because I be, believe that those people are just lacking education they lack compassion and understanding and um and that they are really have the luxury of being that out of tune with um with um, dire straits of poverty in our country. And it's a blessing and a curse. Um, so for me, it was a matter of saying that we were going to um, um, save ourselves. Yeah. And if we could just save ourselves, then we could, I mean, the craziest thing, we were even thinking in our mind, Melissa, that, well, we could just, after we make it, we could give the money back to the bank. <laughs> uh, I, I could just see you guys saying, if only. And, and if you, only, guys, if only. you guys are probably sleep deprived because of your son. <laughs> you know, you have all of these all issues going on and just being faced with like problem after problem after problem. Desperate people do desperate things. That's they right. do. That's right. And so for me, it is um, to me, someone that makes the um, I have seen in our society where folks will judge the decision that my husband and I made more heinous than they would um, judge someone like Bernie Madoff or mm -hmm. this other young trooper with FTX. And, you yeah. know, is he. You know, and 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 don't you're in Texas. Let's talk about Enron. The mm -hmm. attorneys of Enron made seven hundred mm -hmm. million dollars, and 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 they they took millions of dollars mm -hmm. from people. Let's talk about the bailout with the banks, and, and you know, it, we, could we, and we could go on and on, and it just seems like our system judges one person that says I'm going to regain financial solvency by taking the money. Um, yes, maybe I used a weapon in the commission of our offense, but what about those? That just use a pen, but know that they're robbing millions of families of resources mm -hmm. for their own personal gain. Mm -hmm. um, so it's just another lens to be able to look at what we consider to be inappropriate behavior in our society. And also understanding that we as human beings, we're more than the worst thing that we have ever done. That is so true. I had that a professor, totality. At, yeah, an ethics professor in grad school. He wrote a line. And I'll never forget this. It was one to a hundred. Mm -hmm. And then right by a hundred was 98. And he said, from one to 98, I don't have to worry about that. But from 98 to a hundred, better believe we are all capable of, of things that you would never imagine. So That's keep right. in mind that little 2% that could mm -hmm. be anybody. Mm -hmm. And I mean, it's, it's just a fact that not all of us have the same opportunities. Right. That's, mm -hmm. that's just a fact. Right. And it's also just the fact that things are not equal and fair in our mm -hmm. society, especially in our justice system. Yes. Mm -hmm. And so you guys did make a, a terrible, horrible decision that landed you in prison. But talk to us about that prison um, experience, especially you, you were, I mean, in my mind, you're, you're there with like the, the killers, the rapists. I mean, this was like a, this was a serious bloody hard place to be for first That's offend right. first time offender mm -hmm. So, so Angola State Prison uh was is known as the bloodiest prison in the world and did um, you say the world in the yes, world yes. Mm -hmm. so out and of all, all the 
out of everywhere mm. the yes, world yes. Mm-hmm. and and that's why the feds had to even come in and take over the prison because of its historical um um place in our in in our world and what was going on there and then when you think about all of the other notorious prisons uh similar in kind um basically alcatraz and rikers and you mm-hmm. know places just like that but these are prisons that are no longer prisons mm. uh for those very same reasons uh, and Angola is no different. Uh, I think that what makes Angola um, much um, More a lot unique. uniquely situated type of prison is because of uh, how it's uh, set it's up. History. Um, the history of Angola is that um, from Angola, Africa, where slaves used to be brought into the country, mm. uh, used to find their uh, docking point at uh, the grounds or the 18,000 acres that makes that make up the uh, the prison farm itself. It was once a breeding ground. A breeding and, plantation for right, slaves. For slaves that they would uh, then ship from there into uh, New Orleans where they would uh, trade them at the uh, on the trading blocks there. Uh, sometime there into the future, uh, a decision was made to no longer make it a- uh, After the a, Civil War. Uh, to no longer make it a breeding ground. And then it ultimately became a uh, kind of a leasing, leasing plantation. Uh, plantation. And then a what? Plantation? Convict, convict leasing, leasing plantation. Oh, okay. okay. Mm-hmm. So they would lease out the through black codes after the end of the Civil War. Through black codes, they would recapture um the freed men uh and women, and um then they would bring them into this convict leasing where they would then sell them for labor and they would work them literally till they died. Mm-hmm. Um and then from being a convict leasing plantation, um the former Confederate general who who ran the convict leasing plantation began to make so much money that the state of Louisiana got jealous and they wanted in. So they took back over the property and then it became Louisiana State Penitentiary. Mm-hmm. Mm. And uh, Louisiana State Penitentiary is um, probably uh, surrounded about uh, three fourths of the way by by the uh, Mississippi River. Uh, it is home to uh, about six thousand men uh, that are locked there. Uh, the mass majority of whom are serving uh, life sentences, and the, the small percentage of those who are not necessarily serving life sentences uh, are serving practical life sentences. So, mm-hmm. uh, for all practical purposes, everyone that is um, that is sentenced to uh, Angola State Penitentiary they're sent there to die. Is sent, they are either they're all sent there to die, be it through mm. the through execution or through it uh, by day by day. Mm. Um, Death by death incarceration. By incarceration. Mm-hmm. And so when you mount those things up, you are really able in our situation to witness the power of God um, because God is love and love is God. You are able to bear witness through our story um, um, as you turn the page about um, what the power of love can do even when you are in the most dire straits. Mm-hmm. Um, Angola was the most dire straits. We were in a the pits of hell for 21 years. Literally. Um, but, but just like God kept Daniel in the lion's mm-hmm. den and Meshach, um, be, what's, the, what's the other one's name? <laughs> Meshach, Abednego. The, the, <laughs> I, I, I can never the say R. them. But, right, yeah. right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, there you go. No, no, it didn't start with R. <laughs> we see that some of the most miraculous work that we've witnessed yeah. God do has been performed inside of prison, whether it be uh, the first person sent to prison uh, in the form of Joseph or whether it be the last in the form of Paul uh, for crimes they have either uh, did not commit, um, you know, on their own. Um, but or whether in the case of Paul that you're actually guilty of the crimes, uh, we've been able to see some miraculous work, uh, God's work. Uh, being performed through uh, through all of the uh, people that we witnessed through uh, through the Bible, and those characters uh, served uh, uh, as a um, inspiration, mentors, mm-hmm. they anchor, served as an a, anchor to us. That's right, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, because yes. you realize that just as they had overcome the most dire situation that they and or man can be placed inside of, that they uh, made good despite of it. Mm-hmm. Well, I'm definitely hearing a lot of perseverance and strength and tenacity through your story. I'm guessing that it wasn't all, it wasn't all, you know, persevering and strength. Talk to us about the low points and what that was like for you, especially you, Rob, and, and you too, Fox, because I mean, you guys had your struggle was so different, but challenging in, in so many different ways. So for you, Rob, what was that like to be in the bloodiest of prisons and 
to feel like this isn't fair and why is this happening? And maybe that wrestling with God that like, what, why is this happening to me? Yes, right, exactly. Yes. And um, just as you said, um, I mean, prison in any sort is a, is a challenging uh, condition to find yourself. Um, but it's inside of those moments, like you said, when you're wrestling, when uh, you're looking for something or someone to blame. I mean, I blame the uh, I blame the criminal justice system. I blame, um, you know, just so many different things. I even blame God at one point as to why it was that um, that I, you know, that I found myself in uh, in such a fix. Um, and then um, I guess just God spoke to me. Um, <laughs> in a moment. And in that moment, it was like, instead of me saying, why me? Then it kind of became more so, why not me? Mm -hmm. And it was in that moment, I guess, when you find uh, meaning for your suffering. Mm -hmm. uh, it was through books that I read from other people. It was through experiences uh, that I had uh, witnessed, um, you know, firsthand, you know, with others that I realized that this was bigger than me. That this was yet this was yet again another opportunity uh, for God to both show up and show out. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was going to have to be through my demonstration, through my walk. Um, was I happy about that? Heck no, because mm -hmm. uh, surely He could have used somebody else to, uh, to do this, <laughs> and I would have applauded them from the, uh, from the sideline. You would have helped uh, him even, <laughs> right? <laughs> You know, but um, yeah, that um, like I said, it was a very uh, very uh, challenging uh moment for us. So it made us both have to uh redefine how we even uh, thought about the experience of incarceration, uh, because it was only through thinking about it or seeing it through a different lens that we were able to come up with um things that would help us each uh, find purpose for our suffering. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and for others as well. Right. Mm -hmm. And so our situation, Melissa, was incarceration. But, you know, I'm sure many of your listeners, everybody's got their own stuff. Definitely. Um, we're all dealing with something. Mm -hmm. So whether it's financial collapse, whether it is the loss of a job, whether it is um, health ailments, whether it is a um, a, a child that is estranged, a drug addiction, a broken relationships, obesity. everybody is dealing with something um, it's a part of our journey. And it. Uh, I read a book, uh, a meditation book when I got to prison and it said on um, the first page, when you open it up, it says before enlightenment, chop wood, after enlightenment, chop wood. Mm. The task do not change. The challenges that we have will not change. Um, there will always be challenges, but how we approach those challenges is what we must change if we are to overcome them. Mm -hmm. And so having that understanding, when I started my time in prison, I was broken. Probably the hardest piece of my challenge was that I had socially orphaned my children. Uh, I considered myself to be a good mother and being entrusted by God to bring forth these lives into the world. It was my responsibility to make life better for them, to give them a good quality of life, to even begin their own journey on. And instead of doing that, I had abandoned them and, um, I removed myself from their care, the one person, aside from their father that I knew. And it, I mean, don't get me wrong. I know my, my mother who was willing to take responsibility for them in my absence. I knew she loved them, but that wasn't her job. Those nobody my, nobody does it like mama. Nobody <laughs> does it like mama. And, um, and so that was probably the hardest piece for me was just the fact that not only had I brought shame to my family, but that I had also abandoned, I had orphaned my mm. own children. And, um, and so I was, um, reading again, cause you got, it pulls the thoughts from somewhere. The thoughts that we had, they didn't they work. <laughs> so, so let me we gotta do something, something different. And that's going right. into prison, you had your master's degree. I, I think that's I really important to note. You guys are educated individuals. Yes. Not that that, yes. I mean, not that it makes you better than anybody else, but I think that is very noteworthy to say is that you guys were educated, even with smart our people. Education, even with our education, even with the mitigating circumstances of our offense, we took $5,000 from a bank. Um, we, nobody required medical treatment in our, um, in, in our offense. Um, we, they got all the money back. 
Um, we had a family. We were married. Both of us had previously served in the in our nation's military, but none of that meant anything to this system that they were willing to say that we were um, the worst thing that that society has to offer, Not and we des the... deserve to be removed from society for life. Right. And that's also including uh, the victims' uh, wishes themselves. Uh, they didn't ask for a 60-year sentence. At most, mm. they had asked for a 10-year sentence. They thought mm. that a 10-year sentence was appropriate. Wow. Uh, that is a far cry from the 60-year sentence that was actually implemented. But um, as so that was probably the piece of looking at all of that. And for me, as I'm reading and thinking about how it is that I move, um, um, I read a quote that was talking about Jesus when he came into a city. Mm -hmm. And um, and I was thinking about how they said that everything was different when Jesus arrived. Mm -hmm. And so I wanted to be a demonstration that if I'm here because I'm, you know, I'm questioning God, me, I, I didn't deserve this. I dropped them off at the bank. The, the DA offered me a 40-year deal. 40 years. That was the deal. And so here I am, and I'm, I'm in the midst of these other women who have come from far greater challenges than I had come from. And I say, if I'm here, then I want to be like Jesus. And I want it to be different because I'm here. If I'm here, it's for a reason. So how can I use my presence in this time to be of impact and um, change the situation and the, the dynamics because God has placed me here? That's right. So I'm hearing you say that uh, you were riddled with shame and guilt, mm. but mm. somehow from that shame and guilt, it really brought you to a place of leadership mm. and, and seizing a moment and I, I'm curious about a story maybe of, of you helping another inmate, a, a, a female friend out and what that was like for you to be able to empower somebody else who maybe hadn't previously been able to be empowered. I think that every person that Rob and I have touched either by word or by deed or just by demonstration, which we have learned is the most powerful tool. People don't care what you know unless they know you care. That's right. And you don't have to say a word. People will watch you and gain from you what they need to take from you. I can say I love you all day. I can say that I love my family, but it is the demonstration that I put forth that is going to speak louder than any words that ever come out of my mouth. I should tell you about her very first uh, speaking <laughs> opportunity that she had when she stepped into uh, into the female prison. It was a story about Humpty Dumpty. <laughs> So, so, you know, when you walk in faith, you know, I'm going to use this moment. If they have taken me away from my children and my family because they feel like I still need time out or um, then I have got to make sure that I utilize this. And so I have mm -hmm. always had a gift of speaking. It's always been my passion. And that was the dream while opening the store that I was looking to pursue. So um, um, uh, Wayne Dyer, one of the spiritual leaders that I like to listen to, he says, anything you you're ever going to be, you are it already. That's so right. in the spirit of that, I start, I, uh, I was checked into prison on a Thursday. And by that Sunday, I said, you know what? If I'm a motivational speaker, then I'm a motivational speaker right here. And who needs empowerment more than the women in this dorm? It's 75 of us in this open dorm, yep. locked in all day with nothing yep. to do because it's a privately held prison. We use the restroom, Melissa, in, in eight open toilets. Yeah. You know, right in front of me when I'm trying to take care of my, my, my business, it is someone's bed. We got eight open showers that 75 of us must share. Who needs motivation more than we do? So I stood in front of the dorm that night and I said, excuse me, ladies, if I can have y'all attention, but I was a, I'm an empowerment speaker on the street and I figured we could use- I have come here today. <laughs> empowerment in here That's tonight. tomorrow. So, yes, I said, so, you know, I told my speech that night was Humpty Dumpty. And I said that um, Humpty Dumpty sat on the wall and he had a great fall. That's just like us. We, we were up here. Here, you know, at the height of what we thought was our lives. And now all of us have taken this, this fall. I said, but unlike Humpty Dumpty, who couldn't be put back together again, we are created by a master 
that ain't finished with us yet. That's right. And they can restore us to our best selves, um, that we can come out of this experience better than we've ever been. And um, so yeah, that would be an example of how I, I did my time. And, and um, from every institution that I went to, um, from that point forward, it was the same thing of, of letting the women know that we can put our lives, this situation does not have to be the demise of us. God has something better in store for us. It's just for us to believe it and keep working toward it until it's made manifest. Wow, what an impact God on this. done so much stuff inside of prison. <laughs> this guy started a kitty corner for the children to have visits. This guy has been a mentor. This brother has even put on marathon. He's put on 10 marathons. How many did you? 10 marathons inside of the prison. He was running on the inside. I was running on the outside to raise awareness about mass incarceration. And one of the runs that Rob put on, he had all 100 men, about 100 men shave their heads Love it. and run for St. Jude's and incarcerated men raised six, what was it? Almost $600 mm -hmm. to send to St. Jude's hospital for cancer for children, you know? Mm -hmm. So it's not where we are. It's just how we continue to let God use us in that process. Mm -hmm. this. That's so good. It's not a whole lot of money when you, but when you put it into context that we only make four cent an hour as people that are, that are committed to prison. $600 is like a life savings, you know, uh, it's a life and then to savings. give and then to give it away, uh, to someone else is, um, is what we were hopeful to, uh, to demonstrate that despite mm. our circumstances that we still could do good in the world. We care too. That was you know, the name we care too was the, mm -hmm. name of the, was the theme of the run itself. Mm -hmm. Well, I think about the woman, uh, that gave her might, whatever that's mm -hmm. worth, you know, in the Bible and how right, right. God blesses that above and beyond. And so that, mm -hmm. that $600 probably turned into $6 million because that, <laughs> that's the way God's Pulling economy with works. Dave Thomas and St. Jude. Sure <laughs> yeah. You know, um, I want to go back to what you said, Fox, about uh, not letting your circumstances define you. Because I think for a lot of us, you know, one in three people will be sexually abused by the time they reach 18. Um, there's every one of us is going to experience some type of trauma. Every one of us, even though researchers don't say that as a counselor, that's my belief is that all of us go through something. That's right. And instead of letting it define us, it's about saying, who am I? Who did God make me to be? And how can I live that out? Even though I maybe don't have the, the position or the title Maybe people don't see me as that, but how can I still be that for other people? And I think for you to stand up in front of the toilets, the showers, the beds, and to say, Humpty Dumpty, <laughs> I think that took a lot of confidence and conviction that in a couple of days time, you said, I'm going to be utilized in the situation. I'm not going to, I'm not going to be a victim. I'm not going to let this define me. I'm going to stand up and I'm going to advocate for women who quite frankly have not had somebody advocate for them. That's, That's right. right. That's right. I wear pearls, Melissa. I see that. It is my trademark and I love them, <laughs> but I love pearls because the only way that they can be formed is through harm in an oyster. Hmm. If there is no harm, the oyster doesn't make a pearl. Mm. And so when you think about that and how something so beautiful and unique, every pearl is unique. When you think about that, then it helps me better understand it. When times get tight, I'll just sit there and I'll rub on them like some people do their rosary beads. But to me, it just reminds me that out of some of the greatest harm can come some of the most beautiful things mm -hmm. if we allow God to use us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think that's so hard too, because, you know, there's phrases now like toxic positivity and not just like putting a smile on your face. So what would you say for the person who is maybe in transition and they're being beat up right now and, and they're not seeing the the benefit? They're not, they're not believing that a pearl is going to come. It feels like this isn't fair. I'm angry. This isn't right. Or I feel guilty. And why do I keep doing this? How do you go from that leap of the circumstance to the victory? 
For me, it was a minister that would come by the store and pray for me sometimes. And uh, he was one of the prominent ministers in Shreveport, um, a part of the full gospel ministry. And when you would ask him, he just recently made his transition. Uh, Fred Codwell mm -hmm. Sr., you'd say, uh, Bishop Codwell, how are you today? And he says, well, I'm exceptionally well, darling. And I, <laughs> now I'm at my low point. I'm barely scraping, getting by. My husband's locked up. I just got home from prison. And and uh, he says, um, no, I was facing charges, waiting to go to prison. And I, I said to him, you know, I just cannot wait till the day that I can say that and mean it, right? Mm -hmm. He says, well, that's the catch, darling. You got to keep saying it until you can mean it. And so mm -hmm. I think that we don't really, the Bible says that the power of life and death lies in our tongue. That's right. That for us to think it is one thing, but when we speak it, we get it. Declare it. it. Mm -hmm. That's right. We declare it. And so we have to declare those things over and over. And the more that we say it, the more it becomes our truth. And so now, no matter what my experience may be, whether I'm in a favorable moment in my life, if it's a favorable season, a season of, of harvesting or a season of sowing, when I say that I'm exceptionally well, as the old gospel song says, it is well in my soul. So since it is well in my soul, if, it's, if, if whatever this is, I know it's to make, you know, the harm is to make a pearl. Mm. It, it's to make something beautiful on the other side. So I just keep speaking it until I can get to that point in my reality. Like 21 years, it, it's January um, now. It's the top of the year for us. And um, and so a habit for our family is to sit down and write out our intentions at the end of the year, yeah. write out what we accomplished and then what are our intentions for the forthcoming year. Well, every year it was Rob is coming home. Every year, our family is going to be restored. And so when you really think about the, for the lack of a better word, the mind game that you have to play with yourself. Determination. You this entire year believing that this was the year with every fiber yeah. of your being. Mm -hmm. And it turns out not to be the year. Then you say, not my will, Lord, thine be done. And so then you pick up at the next year and you have to read. Uh, affirm again this I know I said it last year <laughs> but this one this is the one yeah I, I mean, feel like I feel like that's for somebody listening today that wants to give up yeah that they've been praying for something and praying for something and believing for something and it just feels like it's never gonna happen I can only imagine how you guys felt on year 20 mm. two decades well, 20, God has shown us light mm -hmm. yeah okay God has shown us light by 20. I mean, and it really started building probably five years before okay. Rob's release that we could really see like over there. But it is a matter of when you think about the beginning of the journey, um, that you have to see a sparkle of light when you know this tunnel is dark. You just have to know on the other side of all this darkness, it's some light. I just got to mm -hmm. keep going until I get there. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, this again, the scripture that comes to my mind is in Ephesians that, that God will do more than we can ever imagine. And in the message, it says dream of it, but it's so hard to hold faith whenever it feels like all you can see is discouragement and to believe that that light is coming. Rob, what, what would you, how would you respond to somebody who feels like maybe that light isn't coming for me, or if it was going to come, it would have already, it would have already came. Mm. Uh, probably the first thing that I would say is stop believing that um, <laughs> in order to believe that things can get better. You have to continue to, as a, a gentleman told me, you have to say it, say it, say it until you see it, see it, see it. Mm. And Fox mentioned it, uh, you've mentioned it. And we both have, have, we all understand that um, there is a power, a real power that exists. Um, when we set our sights, when we set our words, when we set our intentions on a thing, uh, when we think a thing, um, we think that to over trillion, we do that to over seven trillion cells in our bodies when we do that. So if we just understand just some of those basic fundamentals, some of those basic powers, those basic truths, we have to then say, well, okay, if if better is where I'm hopeful to uh, to get to then I have to believe that better is possible, even in the moments that I can't see it. Uh, faith is a substance of things hoped for, but it's That's evidence right. of things not seen. 
So a lot of times when we can't see the way, we just have to know that the way exists and um and continue to move in the direction of um of what it is that we're hopeful for, and for I, ourselves. I would add, if I may, the 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 um the example, the demonstrations of others. Anything man has done before, mankind can do again. That's right. And so being able to extract from these century old examples in the Bibles, examples of just yesterday, mm -hmm. we all know somebody who has faced Overcome. the impossible and they overcame. And so even when I can't see it for myself, if I can see what has happened for someone else, I was... um. The very first book that I bought Rob um, when he went to prison and I'm walking through Barnes and Nobles trying to like, what in the world do you send? How, sur how surreal was that experience? Oh, uh. my goodness. <laughs> I'm like, you know, something has got to help. It has all of these books. There has to be something in here that will make a difference for us. And uh, it, God led me to man search for meaning. Mm. That, that's the exactly what I was thinking of whenever I read y'all's book. And I, wow. I flipped the back and I was like, hmm concentration camp you know uh, i was like Check. man this guy's gotta know something and he made it through <laughs> so you know i sent it to rob and then rob said it calls me back you know and he says man thank you that mm. book was perfect i never cracked the pages to see what was in it it was just like the man search for meeting he, we we have definitely got to find the meaning in this mm. and um and then he says you have got to read this book fox and when i went then and got a copy for myself and i said okay so when I search for the meaning, I can get past all of this other stuff that I've got to go through to get to the other side, because I know that there is a meaning. And as human beings, that purpose, um, Rick Warren talks about the purpose driven life. If we, uh, to me, people that are, are acting out and, 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 and not finding their way is because we're not acting out of purpose. We That's could right. endure the 21 years because we had a purpose that we knew that on the other side of this, God was going to allow us to be a demonstration. And the, the quote that you made out of Ephesians, you talk about showing up and showing out, Oh my goodness. You know, we did this documentary for your listeners that may have seen the documentary time on Amazon. Our whole objective of doing the documentary was because we felt like the only way we were going to get robbed out is if we were able to let people know what was going on that. But the man knew then they would they would understand how um shameful this is and yeah. and help us fix it and as god would have it our freedom came and was able to be a part of the documentary and then being able to show that victory to other people never in our a million years this it was supposed to be a 15 minute op doc on the new york times website mm -hmm. but after you know the that long haul of faith, me recording, because I'm going to capture these moments and I'm going to hold them for my husband, that we would be able to use that. And then this project ends up being a full feature film that is able to bless people all over the globe, taking these two former bank robbers and formerly incarcerated citizens all the way to the Oscars. Mm. Melissa, I got to send you our picture, girl. <laughs> you got to. Yes. That's a, that's a bucket list for me to, to, to be at the Oscars as a you know, audience member, if way in the back, but you know. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, just to be able to see that trajectory of what God can do for you when you, it's, I, I, That's right. the thing that kept coming to my mind was when you're faithful over a few things. That's right. You got to make it yeah. over many. Mm -hmm. And now yeah. this book, you know, well, you know, the, the documentary was, um, the documentary was Garrett Bradley, our d directors, it was her depiction of our story, mm. but this book being able to uh, uh, um, have a relationship with Baker Books that allows us to tell our story in alternating voices from our own perspective, in our own words about what this journey meant for us and what our God did for us. Um, it's just, you know, another elevation of when you're faithful over a few things. That's right. Yeah. Well, it really is um, inspirational, both for the person going through something, but also to know to, to look on others with kindness and compassion because you don't know what they're going through. I tell this all the time to my, to my kids when they, when they're facing somebody mean at school, I'm like, it's not right what they're doing, but you have no idea what they're going through in their home life. 
Mm-hmm. That's the word I was at. Uh, my bunkmate was um, a former um, crack addict from New Orleans when I first got to prison. And I'm judging. I've watched all the TV episodes of all the prison shows. And I'm like, oh, Lord, here I am. And I'm in prison and these people. And I'm thinking about the images I have seen of what prison life looks like. And the lady comes over to me because, you know, I hadn't talked to nobody yet. Yeah. Right? She comes over to me and she hands me a soup and some cheese, and a pack of sausage. And I'm like, what's that for? She said, well, you just got here, so it's going to be over a week for your money gets on your book, and the food here sucks, and you're going to need something, so you can just pay me back when you get your money back. You know, that kindness that I was never anticipating, especially not in this system, but she also told me, she said, and you're going to love this, she said, baby girl, let me tell you, two mountains may never meet, but two people will. Mm. And so that very person mm-hmm. that's being mean, you know, the very person that is being unkind, um, you just got to be careful how you treat people along the way and have some compassion and some kindness, because they'll be the very person that God will have there as your doorkeeper when you're trying to cross over somewhere. Mm-hmm. And that, that's hard. It, that's hard whenever you're in that moment, those moments of greatness, because you can often feel like, well, this is all because of me. And you should be able to get where I'm at. And if you worked hard, like I worked hard, then you would be there. And there's so much pride and arrogance and, um, speak on it, Melissa. Mm -hmm. Speak on it. And so, um, just one final question for the listener who's maybe feeling like they're, they're going through something or they're frustrated by someone. What's a final word of encouragement based on y'all's story and everything that you guys have been through. I'd love to hear from both of y'all just a final word, maybe something that you're feeling that that's for somebody. Mine is a hymn that comes into my heart as soon Mm. as you ask the question. And it says, I can do all things through Christ. It's a gospel, the the verse that they've made into a gospel song. I can do all things through Christ that strengthens me. Mm -hmm. Is that how that goes? Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Be jealous. (laughs) Uh, um, for me, it would have to be, um, and I just pulled this from, um, from my own experience and that is, is, um, to never give up, uh, for those who have had an opportunity to, uh, to witness, uh, time, the, uh, documentary, uh, streaming live on Amazon prime video. Uh, when I exit the prison, I have a t-shirt that has, that has those very words on it. Never give up. Um, that was something that maybe about 10 to 12 years into our incarceration, I was working at the, uh, graphic arts and communications, um, um, getting a, a certification and, um, had, uh, the opportunity to do this as a project. So I created a t-shirt, uh, we were doing something relative to messaging. And, uh, so I created that t-shirt and put it in my locker box and said that, you know, one day I'm going to wear this shirt when, uh, when I walk out of prison. Mm-hmm. And I had maybe another eight years or better, you know, uh, on my journey uh, to walk before it would happen. Um, but just in that faith and that moment, knowing that um, that if you never give up, you'd be surprised at what it is that you will witness on the other side mm-hmm. of um, on the other side of hardship mm-hmm. when you never give up. Mm-hmm. So I say to anyone that is suffering through whatever the hardship may be for you, just don't give up. Mm-hmm. Keep going. Just keep going. Well, your, your guys' story is inspirational again for us all, no matter what circumstances we're going through, we need to have stories to, to, to look at, to model. And you guys are a wonderful story of, of love, perseverance, inspiration, and also advocacy. So thank you for the work that you're doing. And, and we wish you nothing but blessings on your work. Thank you you so much, Melissa. You're so welcome. See you again after we get the New York Times bestseller. Let's do it. (laughs) 